morning. Pretty good? Doing well? Good, good, good. You're part of something big, right? The, the advancing of the kingdom of Christ, okay? So I have a lot to share with you this morning. So if you need to go to the bathroom, now's a good time. I'm not joking. So, uh, if you, but if, you're, if you want to, uh, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. I want to thank those guys for getting up there and doing that this morning. They don't need an applause, but they... Uh, just played for the first time together yesterday morning, so I think they did pretty, pretty well there. Thank you so much for that blessing. Uh, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, and while you're turning there, I want to remind you again as to why I say that to you every single week, to open your Bibles to. Why are we here? Why are we gathered around God's Word? Let me remind you what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says that all scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. And that God uses it, what's it? The word, right? The scriptures. All of it, because it's all inspired. God uses all of it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. That's the reason why we study the word of God, okay? So generally, the word of God, because of what you just read, not my opinion, but because of what you just read, it generally speaks to our mistakes and our failures as a race as a whole, right? It's speaking to a race of people, an entire human race, that what the scriptures would say, we know that it's true, uh, a group of people that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And, and another thing that the word of God says, it says, and this is crazy, no one is righteous, no, not even one, okay? You see this little baby right here, this beautiful little baby? As, as, as cute and cuddly as, as she is, um, no one is righteous, no, not even one. And so God, in his kindness to his people, because he doesn't want to leave us hanging, right, he provides our corrective in the form of his word. And that's why we study it every single time we gather here, right? So now, listen, here's the deal. If you're in agreement with what is preached on the weekend, when you come into this room and you're in agreement with what is preached, not only in belief, but in practice, awesome, right? That's awesome. You'll, if, if, you, if you agree with what's being preached from his word, the corrective for the human race, then, then you may feel encouraged, right? Hey, good job, right? That, that can happen, right? But if you're not in agreement with the text that's being preached, right? in both belief or practice, then you might come in here and you, you may feel a little bit corrected. Right? You may feel a little corrected. Hey, 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 son. Get back on track, right? You might, you might feel that. And then sometimes you're going to hear that word preached, and if you're not in agreement with what it says and what you're doing, then you might get rebuked. Like, you, right? I screamed at Jackson the other day. It wasn't a correction. It was a rebuke. Get in line, kid. You're doing it wrong, right? Sometimes God has to do that to us, right? Need an old crack in the rear end from the Lord. Sometimes we need that, right? And so, listen, here's how, here's how Paul would lead Timothy in this way. 2 Timothy chapter 4, just the first couple of verses. Listen up. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom. So like he got that guy's attention, right? As I hope it's gotten your attention, as, it, as I could tell you, it got my attention. He's like, listen, God's listening right now. God's watching what I'm about to tell you, so listen up. Preach the word of God. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not, Right? Whether you want to preach what it says, if you're in the mood to preach what it says, what does that mean? Nothing, Nothing, right? And also, it also means whether the preacher wants to preach it or not means nothing. It also doesn't matter if you want to hear it or not. It doesn't matter, right? Because you're not the truth. God's the truth and everyone else is a liar. 
So, so, so whether you like it or not, whether you want to or not, you have to hear the word of God because it's our corrective. Look at it, he goes on to say, be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage. They're the three things right there, right? I'm not making anything up, am I? To correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. And it's kind of weird because we're all in a room together, and there's one person talking, and the rest of you are listening. And so this, that's the context here, right? Here's, Paul says, hey, Timothy, get up in front of your people and preach. Preach the word. And, and some are going to get corrected, and some of them are going to get rebuked, and some of them are going to get encouraged, right? Same word, three different results. Where are you at this morning? So, so listen, as a pastor, a long time ago, when I said yes to Jesus to be a preacher, I accepted this admonition from Paul as not just to Timothy, but to me as well. And so that's why when you come to this church, I can't speak of any other, but when you come to this church, you'll see week after week, month after month, year after year, consistently, we just go through books of the Bible, chunk by chunk, and my task, and the task of anyone who would stand at this pulpit, is to expose to you what this book says as the original writer intended it to be said For those people in that context, what does it mean? And then we let it bear its weight on us today. What's the similarities there? What did it mean to them? What's it mean to us? And that's what we're supposed to do each and every week. And so all scripture, it says, you saw that, all scripture is God breathed. I I love that, right? God breathed, right? It says in Psalm 33 that he, he, God just simply breathed. And the stars were formed, right? And that same power that breathed stars out of his mouth at 186,000 miles per second, that same power that's in his breath inspired this that you have in your hands this morning. It should make you tremble some, right? It should. And that means if it's perfect and it's God-breathed, that means it's both perfect in content and in the order. You don't need to tell Peter or Paul or James or Jesus, hey, you kind of, you should have said this a little bit differently. I think they would have got the point more. Right? It's perfect the way it is. And so that's why a church that gets up and clearly and passionately walks through the books of the Bible as they are presented, all of it says this and that's it. That's the best way to honor the Lord. Okay, now you have to understand that even though all scripture is God-breathed, All of it, right? Can you say the word all? All. Right, every single word. But some of it wouldn't exactly warrant an entire sermon. And that would be a case in point right here, what I asked you to turn to here in Acts chapter 20. Like the first 12 verses, they probably wouldn't warrant an entire sermon. But if every single word of God is from him and is useful to teach us something, then it would be negligent to just breeze through it and ignore it, okay? So I'm not going to read the first six verses, but you can take a glance as I'm talking. You won't offend me in any way. You can take a glance at the first six verses of Acts 20, and you're going to see that it's simply describing the path uh, 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 of Paul's mission, you know, where he's going with the gospel. And it'll list some of the people, some of the men that that went with him and accompanied him on this mission to reach the people with the gospel. And and so certainly, even though it's just like a descriptive text, just kind of telling us what happened, certainly we can can still glean something from it. We can glean that, that the mission to advance the kingdom comes with difficulty and so anyone who would stand before you and say, give your life to Christ and, and, and just go tell everyone about him and it's going to be real easy and you're going to tell people and they're all just going to, they're going to come to Christ just like Billy Graham, right? You're going to stand over there to these people and you're going to tell them the good news and they're going to rush your altar and they're going to bow down and say yes to Jesus, right? That is not the case. Okay, that is not the case. I remember when I first got into ministry, someone invited me to a pastor's seminar, like a conference, and they were talking about pastor sabbatical. 
I'm so pathetic when I was so young. I, I walked out of there. I was like, what's wrong with these guys? They only work one day a week. How can they need a sabbatical? You need rest? Why don't you freaking toughen up and get back into the battlefield, right? People are dying, going to hell, and you need a vacation? You know, 15 years later, I can tell you this times, I want to jump in front of the quickest bus that's coming my way. Okay, I understand that it's difficult sometimes, a lot of times, most of the time, right? But I didn't realize that then. It's not easy to advance the kingdom of God. And if you read that text, you're going to see uh, there, and then also, let me go to my book of Acts here. You're going to see also that there's some goodbyes. There's some goodbyes. There's some sacrifice. At the beginning of Acts chapter 20, you see that he had to say goodbye to some of these people. And, and, in, and in Acts chapter 20, towards the end, it says that he tells the people in verse 25, and, I know, and, I, and now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. Like it's been very, very difficult, but he had to say goodbye to some of these people. He says in verse 31, to watch out, remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day and my many tears for you, right? He, he, he loved these people. He loved these people. He took seriously the call to be their pastor and their shepherd and to care for them and to pray for them and to, to guard them, right? From the wolves that would come and try to cause damage. And he's crying over it, right? But the, the Lord called him somewhere. And so sometimes you have to say goodbye to people that you love, right? I'm reminded of a, of a family here at our church, uh, Judy and David Strickland. I love them. They were awesome. They were faithful. They were servants. They were gracious. They'd come and pray for us. They were great people. And one day, out of the blue, they said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. And they said, the Lord has called us to go, to go build, to start a pastor's retreat in South Carolina. So we bought this piece of property with a little lake on it, and we're going to build a chapel, and we're going to have a little cabin, and the people, are, people like you who are beat to death are going to have to come up there and get rest for their soul. I didn't want to see them leave. Like, it's awesome they were going to do that, but do you think I wanted Dave and Judy to leave? Right? Who, who wants, when you have a church that's trying to grow, who wants two people that are faithful in every which way to up and leave? You're looking for people like that, right? And they were kind, and they were generous, and they were so gentle-spirited, both of them. I love those guys, Right? And they left because the gospel requires some goodbyes sometimes. And it's painful. But the point of this that we can get from the text is that what we want doesn't matter. What he wants is all that matters. I or you or some of you may be called out of this place to go to, to, to Kalamazoo. or so. I don't know where you might go. God might call you. Some people have left this church because of selfish endeavor. And they just like, hey, I like skiing. I'm out of here. The Lord called me. No, he didn't. But if God calls you to go do something like you did to Paul, you just do it, right? And so sometimes there's going to be some painful goodbyes. We can also see from the text that there's danger involved in advancing the kingdom of God. You'll see in the text that there was a plot against his life, right? It says there in verse two, 3, he said that for three months he was preparing to sail back to Syria when he discovered a plot by some Jews against his life. Like, that's not the first time that's happened in the book of Acts. And I believe there's going to be more times in the book of Acts that that happens. So the two things we can just glean from this text, without going into it too deep, but we can see, because every word is useful to teach us, that there's two things. One, the kingdom of God and advancing it has its challenges, that it's not easy, okay? And we need to know that. If you go in unprepared and you think it's going to be easy, it's going to knock you in the dirt, and you're going to give up. But if you know in advance that it's challenging, it'll help you fight. So the first thing you need to know is that the kingdom of God has its challenges. And the second thing that we need to know, and we see it here in the text, is that we need resolve. We need resolve. We need to stand firm. God called. God said go. And it's not easy, but I'm going to do it anyway, right? We need to see that. Okay, look at verses uh, 7. Let me see. I don't even know what my notes say here. 7... Oh, yeah, okay, so here's, let's go on to the next, the next section of Scripture, right? We don't want to blow it off. I love this part. This is the preachers. This, this one chapter in all the Bible that's dedicated to preachers. This is it right here. This one section of one chapter. So just humor me as we read this, right? If I dwell a little long on this, you might just understand. 
On the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. That's communion. Paul was preaching to them. And since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. See? You see what I mean there? Yeah. He kept talking until midnight. And he wasn't just talking. What was he doing? Preaching. He was preaching, right? He was preaching. He kept talking until midnight. The upstairs room w- where we met was, was lit with many flickering lamps. As Paul spoke on and on. I love it. You see what I mean? Can we just dwell here for a little while? As Paul spoke on and on. See, the problem is, is that you guys, have, you do what you do all week, right? And then you come to church and you want a little something. The problem is I've been doing this all week. So I have to like tone it back a little bit so, to try to, so it doesn't go three hours. Like I'm in this thing all week long trying to, you know, I'm gleaning out of this, this diamond mine. And I'm like, oh, I got all this, I got all this. I got, and I got to like tone it back because otherwise we'll be here all day. I see why Paul was doing this. But he had, a, he had an audience that wanted it. As Paul spoke on, that was a, did, you feel, did you feel that? <laughs> Just saying. As Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill became very drowsy. See, preaching can do that too. I've had people do that right in the front row. I'm preaching. <laughs> right? Frankie G. Okay. Eutychus. Who's having a kid here soon? Anyone? Eutychus would be a great name, right? Eutychus. Awesome. Okay, listen. So he gets drowsy. Finally, he fell asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. All right, did he, did, is, was it like they thought he was dead? What was he? Right, flat, flatlined. Fell to his death. Paul went down, bent over him, took him into his arms. Don't worry, he said. He's alive. Yeah, that's awesome. Then they all went back upstairs and had communion. Let's eat. Ray, you ready? This is, this is the, it gets better. Paul continued preaching. So the guy dies, right? You'd think that would be the crescendo of the night. Then he raises him to, to, new, to, to life again. You'd think that's the, the zenith of the, of the evening, right? No. So he starts preaching again. Second service, right? Paul continued talking to them until dawn. Can we just guess, like, how many hours is this? Let's just say it's an evening service. He kept talking until midnight. So it was like before dinner, all night long. So let's just, can we just, like, let's, let's, take, a, let's take a vote. Like, who thinks that up till midnight, like when midnight came, that that was about four or five hours worth of preaching, right? Probably, right? Then the guy dies. He raises him from the dead, and they go take communion, and then he preaches and how many, how many hours till dawn? Another six? The guy preaches for ten hours? Awesome. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home unhurt, and everyone was greatly relieved. That's so awesome. So let's just glean something from that. Obviously, I gleaned that I should preach longer. <laughs> the first thing here we should glean is, is the importance of gathering for communion. Like, it's not in the text just because they just happened to coincidentally uh, do this. They gathered for that purpose. They gathered. They didn't gather to perform the miracle of raising the dead. What did they gather for? It says it right there in the text. What they, on the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share the Lord's Supper. They like, that was the intention. That's the importance of taking communion. On the first day of the week, they did that. That was like the first thing that they did. What do we do? We're starting our week. How do we honor God? Take the Lord's Supper. Take communion the first day of the week. Listen, your church that you're part of, that God called you to, realizes the importance that you see here in the text. Every single week, we do that. And most of you aren't here to participate in that, but we do that every single Monday evening. It says to do it on the first day of the week, right? And don't you, do you guys understand that this is the first day of the week? It's kind of weird because it's called the weekend. I was thinking about that this morning. Okay? How are we supposed to do this on the first day of the week when it's the week end? 
This is the week end. This is the end of the week. So how could it be the end of the week and the beginning of the week at the same time? So for all intents and purposes, I'm not saying that we should change the calendar, but what's really our first day of the week? Monday really is. This is the weekend, right? So on Monday night, guess what we do? We take communion together. It's not in there because it's a, like, cool idea. Do you think maybe it's in there because all scriptures God breathed and it's there to instruct us to tell us what is right and to correct you when you're wrong? So if you're supposed to be taking communion on the first day of the week and you're not here, what's that make you? Come on, say it like you mean it. Wrong. It's okay to be honest in church, right? None of us have made it so far. We're, we're not graduated, right? I'm wrong too. So we're supposed to take communion, the importance of communion. Here's the second thing I saw in the text. The importance and priority of preaching. The importance and priority of preaching, right? Do you notice that this guy was, this was the last thing that he was going to do with these people. This was it. So, so listen, it's my last day of vacation, right? We've all been there. It's my last day of vacation. What are we going to do on my last day? It's the most important thing. Like, what's the, the, the most important thing that I should do right now? Because look, it, I only have one opportunity to be with you, church. This is it. Let's just say I was the guest guy here today. I have one opportunity to be with you, and that's it. I'll never see you again. Should I tell you stories about my goldfish? What should I do? Preach the word, right? That's, that's the priority. The, the mo- Listen, it's the most important thing because it's the only thing. He only had one opportunity to do one thing, and what did he choose to do? Preach the word of God to those people, right? The priority of preaching the word of God. And the other thing, too, is look at the people. I made a joke about it, but look at them. They're a willing group. They sat there, and they listened. For like 10 hours, he preached the word of God. And they sat, and they listened, and they were hungry, right? They had their parchment out, and their quill pen, and they're writing notes, and they're studying and observing what he's saying and listening, right? Taking notes. I want this. I need this, right? Because every word of God is inspired of God. It's breathed. That same breath that that breathed the planets into existence is right here in your hand. I need to hear it. My soul needs it, right? It needs it. So we have a desire to preach, and that's for me, and hopefully for some of you, but also a desire to hear, a desire to learn. So as you can see, there's something to glean in every section of the Bible, even in a very descriptive text. It's just there to tell you what happened, right? It, there's no real instruction. It doesn't seem intentionally there to instruct us. It doesn't say, thou shalt this, or thou shalt not that, right? It doesn't say that. It just tells of a story about what happened, but we can still glean even from a totally descriptive section of Scripture. But oftentimes we run into sections of Scripture that are not quite like that at all. As a matter of fact, they'll contain something that's part of like this huge narrative in Scripture, this overflowing, overwhelming theme that just, this strand that continues to go through the Bible, this big deal, this overriding theme. We see it over and over and over again in Scripture. Something that's repeated over, over in Scripture. What's that mean? That clearly says, we need that, right? We need that. That's why it's repeated over and over and over again in the Bible. It's because we need it. So two things that I see in verses 13 through 31, and we'll study these things, but let me jot these things down. These are... These are themes that are mentioned here that are mentioned over and over and over and over again in Scripture. That's my brother right there. Hey, Lady Bonita. So these things are needed. They're needed over and over and over again. That's why it's mentioned over and over and over again in the Scriptures. Here they are. Jot these things down. One, to be led by the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's not a one-shot deal. It's not a one-time mention in Scripture. It's over and over and over again. And here's the second thing. Complete devotion to advancing Christ's kingdom no matter the cost. And it will cost you. 
It's okay. It's the it's the most expensive salvation is the most expensive free gift you will ever receive, ever. Okay. So let's talk first about being led by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let Galatians 5:25 be the foundation of our study here in this part of our message, and it would inform us this way: since we live by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Okay. Since we live by the Spirit. That's an interesting thing for for Paul to say. But here's here's the truth, okay? Embrace this. The Bible says that you and I and all of us were once dead in our sin, right? No one is righteous, not even one. We were all enemies of God because of our sin, right? All of us. We were all dead to God. Were you existing? Yes. Were you breathing? Was your heart beating? Yes, but you were dead to God. And you will never get into his presence on his holy hill of heaven in that condition. You are dead to God. But if you've been saved, if the grace of God has fallen upon you and you have understood your sin nature and you understand that Jesus came to save you and you embrace what he did on your cross on your behalf, right? If you're saved, then his spirit has been given to you. Ephesians 1.13, that when you believed, his Holy Spirit was given to you, right? And when that happened, you are now in Christ. You are now in Christ. The Spirit of God is given to you, to every Christian, and that makes you who used to be dead to God. Now you are alive to God, not because your physical health has changed, but because the living God now resides in you. You are alive to God because God is in you. Okay? You live by the Spirit. Paul would say in Galatians 2.20, I no longer live but Christ lives in me, okay? I no longer live. He understands that even though he's still moving and breathing and thinking, that the, that the, that the, that the source of his life to God is now because God is in him. It has nothing to do with him. He's still alive. He's still breathing, but he's been totally transformed. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died, the scripture says, and behold, I'll be able to see a new man or a new woman. You are now alive to Christ. And since you now live by his spirit in you, right, you now, as a follower of Christ, if you are, have an ob- a holy obligation to follow the Holy Spirit's prompting in every single part of your life. The scriptures would say, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, right? Don't bum him out. Don't bum him out. When he's asking you to do something, he's prompting your spirit to do something, don't bum him out. Do it, right? Do it. Don't, don't, quen- don't quench the Holy Spirit, right? When the Spirit of God is burning inside of you and, and saying, Debbie, I want you to go do this, Debbie. I want you to go do this. Don't take your iced coffee and dump it on the fire, right? Don't bum him out, right? And so we're supposed to be led in every ear. What, what part of your life? Every. What's that? Every. What's another word for every? So it's, yeah. Everything. All that you do, all that you think, all that you say, all the places that you go, led of the Holy Spirit. You are no longer in charge. You're dead. You're dead, right? You've been per- your life is not your own anymore, the scriptures would say. Right? You've been purchased with, by the high cost of the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not your own. Right? So you don't get to call the shots anymore. You're not the CEO of anyone's, of anyone's life, including your own. You're not in charge anymore, and we have to let go of that and let the Holy Spirit lead us in every part of our life. I thought about this this week, too, right? A lot of us are like, we're praying, we're asking God to do stuff, and we, we're, we're asking him to, to tell us what to do. You do that? I do that. But don't, don't, don't think for a second, this is false thinking, don't think for a second that God is saying, when you pray, and he says, I want you to go do this. It's not that he's sending you over there to do that. Okay, go do that. Okay, I got some stuff over here. I need you to go do that. Okay, the word follow assumes leadership. Think about the picture in your mind. Follow means he's already going there. And you're to follow him there. That means he's either already there and he's inviting you into partnership or he's going there and he wants you to come join him in this effort to redeem this. That's what he's doing, right? So assume 
leadership, okay? He's calling you to join him in something he's already beginning to do. Now, all these verses in, in the book of Acts that were read so far, all this stuff in Galatians, right? This is all coming out of the mouth of Paul, who is the pray without ceasing guy. He's the guy who says we should pray for all people, we should pray about everything, and we should pray without ceasing, right? All people, everything, all the time. That's a lot of prayer. That's what's coming out of Paul's mouth, okay? So we're supposed to pray all the time about everything. The Christian life, and I'm guilty, we're probably all a bit guilty of this, the Christian life should be a life of constant interaction with your father. Right? I understand you get distracted, you're driving a bulldozer, you're thinking about Jesus, you might run over somebody. Okay? I get that. Okay? He, he's been buried alive a couple times. Right? So this, this guy's is like Lazarus over here. Right? They bury him and kill him and he wakes up again. That's construction, right? That's site development. They just bury you. Oh, where's Joseph? It's about lunchtime. Oh, he, he's dead. So let's just uncover that guy. Right? So I understand when you're driving a front-end loader, right? you can't always be like ethereal. You can't always be thinking about you know, heavenly-minded stuff. Like You've got to notice what's going on around you. But the, 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 but the Christian life is a life of constant interaction with your Father. Right? He's, he's in you, right? So it's not some far-off God in the heavens somewhere. He's like right here. So if you need to pray, don't look up and kill Him. Look down and you can see the road. Because He's right here. You should be constantly interacting with him, okay? Talking to him about all kinds of things, about everything, all the time, like all the time, right? But notice something. There's been some interactions, some stories with Paul in the book of Acts. I want to remind you of this. Acts chapter 16, it says two times that the Holy Spirit prevented Paul from preaching in a certain area. Now, to me, I don't know about you, and I may be wrong. Maybe I should just put my Bible over here for a second and just speak freely here. The word prevented doesn't seem to ring about prayer. To me, prevented is not, Lord, do you want me to, do you want me to preach in you, Matilla? You know, Moses, I don't, I don't think you should do that. Because listen, if God says that, I could still preach in you, Matilda, couldn't I? But the word prevented is a little bit stronger than that. It sounds to me like God did something. He did something. You know what he did? Roadblock. Try me. Try to go. Like he, he prevented him from doing it. There was, God had done something that prevented him from moving. He couldn't move forward there because God stopped it, right? Just saying. Think about these things when you're reading the Bible, right? Don't just go whizzing through it on a yearly Bible reading plan. Those are crap, right? Slow down and read the scriptures. Glean from it. Meditate on it. When you read that, when it says he prevented, stop. What's that mean, Lord? Let him teach you what it means, right? That's Acts 16. How about Acts 19? Paul was compelled by the Spirit to go to Macedonia. Just compelled. And I think I should go here. I think I should go here. I just think I should go here. This is where I, I think I'm supposed to sit down next to her right now. It's just what I feel like God wants me to do. And then again, here in Acts 20, verse 22, in our text that we're looking at, it says that, again, he was, uh, my, my translation says, bound by the Spirit. Some translations would use that word compelled there, right? Compelled or bound to go to Jerusalem. Uh, the word bound and compelled there is, is the same word that, that Jesus uses when he talks about what he's supposed to do in his ministry. God the Father said this. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm bound to this. I'm obligated to this. This is what God said to do. I'm doing it, right? It's the word deo. It means chained to. It mean, think, of the, think of the soldier with his, with his war captive, right? Think, this is an ugly way to look at it, but look, I'm going to explain it. Think of the master with his slave, right? 
And we're slaves of Christ. We talked about that a few weeks ago, right? We're, we are, whatever we choose to obey becomes our master. We are willing slaves of Christ. Master, whatever you want, I do it, right? No questions asked, never a word of lip back to you. You say it, I do it. That's a, a willing slave. We're slaves. So envision this, this willing, humble, submissive prisoner, slave, being led, right? You don't, how do you lead with a, you don't, when you're leading with a chain, you ain't pushing, are you? You ever push with a chain? Who pushes with a chain? What do you do? You pull. And where's the leader? In front of you, right? That's what's happening. And so he is, his, his, his master, Jesus, is already in front of him, leading him to Jerusalem. I am, I am bound to go to Jerusalem. I have no choice. Now, none of these stories in the book of Acts ever mention that Paul was specifically praying about these things and God answered. Now, it, it may have been, right? But it doesn't say that. So there has to be some room for examining this. What could it possibly mean? But I do know this. Even though it doesn't say that he was praying, I will say that it just it tells the story of, of Paul simply sensing God already at work in an area, and, and he is just saying, yes, sir. I will follow you. My sheep, it says that they hear my voice and they follow me, right? And a lot of times we're waiting and praying. We want to hear the clear voice from heaven, right? You know, when Jesus was, was baptized and the, the clouds kind of open up and there's the voice from heaven and you hear it. This is my son who I'm, I'm well pleased. Follow him. And you're waiting for that same voice to go, that's the girl I chose for you. Marry her. That's the car I want you to buy. Buy that. That's the job I want you to have. Go there. That's the house I want you to live in. That's the town I need you. That, right, we're waiting for the voice from heaven, and we ain't going to get it. But he's leading us. He's leading us. And sometimes you'll hear the voice, but sometimes you won't. So I think the lesson here is the word trust. We have to trust the Lord. We have to trust the Lord. I'm not saying not to pray. Okay, I had to really, really drive this point home to my wife this week as she's sitting with Haley and Amara, and they're talking about praying in their journey study. And I come home, and I'm telling my wife about the message I got from God, and she's like, oh, yeah, so we're not supposed to pray? You didn't hear that. Okay? That's not it at all. What I'm saying is, as Christ followers, yes, pray. But can we just leave some room in our life for simply trusting the Lord in areas that are not sure? Right? That you don't really have the, this is the Father speaking, and I think you should buy a white Toyota. I want to be in the will of God. I want to be in the will of God. What car should I buy? Whatever one gets you to church. <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. That verse I just read to you a few moments ago, Galatians 2, 20, I no longer live but Christ lives in me, goes on to say, so I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God. So here's some things you might want to jot this down. This is really helpful for me. Jot this down in your notes. Trusting God means believing what God says and acting on it no matter what you think or feel. Trusting God means believing what God says and acting upon it no matter, no matter what you think or feel. And here's three reasons why. Because one, all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to His purpose, Romans 8.28 says. Right? No matter what happens, ultimately it's going to work out for your good. Even if the success you thought you were going to have when you reached out of that boat and, and took the step, you thought it was going to be this, and it eludes you. That success eludes you. All things will work out for the good, no matter what. Things have eluded me. But I know that all things work out for the good. That's the first reason. The reason why I could 
trust God and act upon what he says, no matter what I think or feel, is because Hebrews 11.6 says that God is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. It doesn't say anything about whether you found him or not. He says, if you'll come after me, I'll reward you. Come after me and I'll reward you. And don't just come after me. Earnestly come after me. Get after this thing, right? Don't part-time me. Don't leave me on the fence. Don't leave me hanging. You come after me with all that you have. And I will reward that. You know why? Because ultimately, no matter whether it's in life or death, you will be rewarded. All things, all things work out for the good for those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose. Right? All things work out for the good. That's why you trust him. You're going to be rewarded. That's why you trust him. Here's the third thing. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says that nothing, nothing you ever do for the Lord is in vain. Nothing. Right? It doesn't matter if it was a mistake or not. You thought the Lord was calling you to do this, and it didn't work out the way you thought it was. He knows what you did. He records what you did, and he will reward you for what you did, and ultimately everything will work out for the good. Right? No matter what happens. That's why you can trust him. Trusting God means moving forward with what you think or feel he wants you to do, even if you're not sure. I don't want to move. Because if I, if I move, I might not be in his will. How will you know if you never move? And there's an overriding promise in all of Scripture over and over and over and over and over again that, 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 that will really, really bless your heart. Here's why you can move forward. Here's why you can trust in what God says and move forward whether you think or feel. I don't really know. Because I'll be with you. That's why. Because I'll be with you. Right? And, and the promise of I'll be with you in every success and in every failure, his presence, his promise of presence is not dictated by circumstance. He said, I will be with you always. Always, right? That's not altered by circumstance in any way. So in our, in our, in our study here in the book of Acts, we're talking about advancing the kingdom of God, right? We're talking about taking the gospel. We're, we're a culture-creating community, bringing beauty to the world. This is to bring the beauty of a, of a gospel-saturated way of life to a, a world that's lost and hurting and, and in need of it. And we see it more than ever now, right? Put the news on. Do you, think, do you think the world needs the gospel? Do you think black and white people need the gospel that unites and says, I don't care if you're purple, I love you. Amen. Right? They need it. So, so more than ever, we need this. So in this context of studying the book of Acts and moving the gospel forward, what does Jesus tell us? He says, hey, listen, all authority is mine, right? So go make disciples. That's what he said. Well, here's the problem. He never taught us the proper process. He never said, hey, look, when you want to make disciples, use the journey. It doesn't say that in the Bible. I've searched every single translation. None of them say, this is the one size fits all. This is the way you lead people to the Lord and disciple them. It never says that. You know what it does say? Go do it. That's what it says. Go do it. Go make, go make disciples. So let me ask you a question. Do we need to pray about whether we should make disciples or not? Should we, do we need to ask the Lord, hey, should I go tell my neighbor about Jesus? Should I tell my coworker about Jesus? Should I tell my mother about Jesus? Should I tell my kids about Jesus? Do we need to pray about this? For real. Come on, church. Do we need to? Why? Because he's already said it. And my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. He's going forward. His spirit is going forward right now, preparing the heart for the person you're supposed to talk to today. He's already at work, and he's got you by the nose on that chain going, Joseph, come with me. I'm going to talk to him, and I need you to be my mouthpiece. I'm Moses. You're my Aaron. Speak up. That's what he wants, right? You don't have to pray about whether we need to make disciples or not. And then after that, he says, hey, after that, after, they, after you share with them that they're a sinner in need of a Savior, and that Jesus is the one that's going to save them, the only one, and they say yes to that, praise God. Then what did he say? Go baptize him, Right? Did he say to use a feed trough? Did he, did he say to, 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 to use a, a pool at your house? Did he, did he say when you're having friends over for dinner that you don't need to ask 
the Lord whether I should talk to them about Jesus or not, right? He's already told you to do that. So you're over dinner and you're sharing the gospel with them and they say yes. You don't wait to take them to the church. Pastor, can, I, can, we, can you baptize my buddy Pat this weekend? No, put them in your tub at your house. Right? It doesn't say to bring them to the preacher. It doesn't say to put them in a feed trough. It doesn't say anything. It says baptize them. So pool, tub, you're at the lake with your buddies on, the, on your pontoon. And of course, what are you doing while you're on the pontoon? No, you're not. You're preaching. You're, did you hear anything I said 10 minutes ago? You got one shot with these people. What are you going to do? You're preaching the gospel to them, right? And when they say yes, you push them overboard into the lake and baptize them. That's what it says to do, right? Did it say how? See, we laugh about it. I think that's funny too, but is, is that a, that's not okay? What did he say? Go make a disciple and baptize him. You know what baptismo means in Greek? Fully immersed. Chuck him over the edge of the boat. <laughs> Maybe you're at the pool with your buddies. Maybe you're down at the ocean with your friends. You know, your family, they all, everyone wants to come to Florida, right? Go to the beach with them, right? You go to the beach with your family, you're telling them about the gospel. Of course that's what you're doing, right? Of course that's what I'm doing, preacher. I'm telling them about Jesus. What else am I going to do? I got one shot at these people. I'm going to tell them the gospel. Well, I don't know what we're supposed to do about baptism. But I do know he said to do it. So do we need to pray about whether I should baptize my neighbor or my friend? I mean, should we, should we pray about that? No. What do you got? What do you, you know, if it's unknown, you can pray. If it's already been stated, what do you got to pray about? Well, some of us are just pray, 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 pray. You don't do nothing. And then after he said, point out their sin problem and, and lead them to Christ, after they say yes, praise God, stick them in the water, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to obey all my commands. Well, how in the world are we supposed to do that? I mean, never... He never outlined in the particulars in the Gospels to his disciples on how to exactly do that. Like, what's the particulars? What's the curriculum we should do? You know what he said? Teach them. That's his instruction. That's his deep, exhaustive instruction for you. Teach them all that I've taught you. That's it. Okay? Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. That's your directive. That's your specific right there. That's it. And we can do all of these commands that he's given us, knowing all the while that in every success, as we share the gospel with the people, and they, they run to the altar to say yes, and we would celebrate that along with the angels in heaven, right? In every success and in every failure. When you go out there and you... Suck it up, and you're like, I don't really want to do this, but do you know Jesus? Do you know that he died for you, and he loves you, and he can forgive you, and, and I, he's been so good to me, and he can be so good to you? And, and, and they go, oh, hell no, because you hear that, right? They might use words that are worse. Keep your do -do 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 Jesus to yourself. You hear that, right? But in every success and every failure, God is with you. God is with you. See, it's his presence when his presence is there and he's given you his presence by way of his spirit living inside of you. His presence gives us boldness. You see it in Peter when, he was, when they arrested Jesus and they said, hey, you know this guy? He said, I don't know that guy. Right? But when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, when, when, when God's presence was there, what happens? He steps forward and he preaches boldly. Doesn't care if he's going to get killed or not. And what happened as a result? 3,000 people got saved. Through the scaredy cat. Because the presence of God makes us bold. The presence of God gives us words to say. When we don't know, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. You sound like Moses. I don't speak so well. What would I say? Who gives you tongues? Who makes mouths? It isn't, it, isn't it I, the Lord? Now you go, and I'll, I'll be with you as you speak, and I'll instruct you on what you're to say. Right? Take the pressure off of you. Listen, don't ever say, I don't know what to say. You know why? I know you don't know what to say. Amen. That's why God says, but if you'll go, I'll instruct you as to what to say. And I'll give you the boldness to say it. And his presence gives us comfort. Do you know that's what the Holy Spirit's called? The comforter. Right? He's close to the brokenhearted. 
And when you're hurting and you're scared and alone, he'll rush in. Come down on you like a dove. He'll give you boldness. He'll give you words. He'll give you comfort. Trust isn't, yeah, I'll do it because I'm for sure this is what God wants me to do and I'm assured success in my endeavors. There's no such thing as that. But here's one thing you can be sure of. I'll be with you always. That's it. Not assured success. Not assured defeat but assured that he'll be with you. Trust isn't birthed out of a guarantee of success. No, trust comes from knowing that God is with you and that he will work successes and failures ultimately for your good and that he will reward you for even trying. Some of you may be thinking right now about that thing that you know that God's wanted you to do. And it's, he's bringing it back up in your mind right now. And you're trying to beat it down, right? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Maybe some of the pain that you're experiencing in life is because you're saying no, and he's making you miserable. Because you keep saying no to him. He's prompting and prompting, and you're grieving him. You're bumming him out, and he's making your life miserable because you're disobedient. Here's two awesome examples. I could have so many more, but here's two great examples in Scripture of trusting God. Whether you're, you know, I, I haven't heard the voice from heaven, but I kind of think this is kind of what God wants to do. And so I'm just going to go do it. So in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14, you have to go there. Just, just jot that reference down. You can read the story later. But so um, you guys all know King David from Israel, right? He was famous, King David, right? Well, then there was, uh, before him was this King Saul. He wasn't as awesome as David. He had his good moments. He had his bad moments. But he had a son. Saul had a son, Jonathan. And so the, the, Jonathan was a soldier, too, like in his dad's army. And, and, and so the, the Jewish people were always fighting against the Philistines. Remember David with, with, with Goliath, right? How dare these, these Philistines oppose the Lord and his people, right? That, that's what it was. God had his, it's God and his people, and then there was the Philistines, and they were worshiping false gods, and they were awful, bad, naughty people. And so Jonathan is up, in this, up on this, like, this picture like this, this rocky little mound, hill, mountain thing. Just see it in your head, right? And he looks down, and he sees this, this, this garrison, this group of Philistine soldiers, we found out from the text, if you read it later, there was 20 of them. And Jonathan's up there with his armor bearer. He, he's the guy who helps him carry his, his, his sword and his, and his shield. And, you know, his, let's just call it like his assistant soldier guy. Okay? So he's up there in the rocks and he's with his assistant soldier guy. And every, 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 every king needs a, a, an assistant soldier guy too, right? Guys are going to fight with you. And, and, he, and he's sitting up there, and they're looking down, and they see this group of 20 soldiers, and always, there's only two of them. And just remember that this, he's an armor bearer, so this young kid probably doesn't even have his own armor, right? He's carrying the, the other guys. And he looks at, and Jonathan looks at him and goes, hey, man, let's go down there and attack those dudes. <laughs> right? That's stupid, right? There's 20 of them, basically there's one of you, but see, here's the thing. Jonathan knew the task. God had already told his people, that's the enemy, I want you to kill them, right? I'm going to win. You're, you're going to win. They're going to lose. This is what I want you to do. See, we already know some stuff that God wants us to do. Not in prayer specifically, but he's already told us in advance. We know what he wants us to do. And so Jonathan kind of knew what his task was. In the moment, it seemed kind of stupid to go have like one and a half dudes attack 20 that are fully armored with swords and shield warriors, right? Doesn't make many, much sense. But he says, hey, let's go down there and attack them. Listen to this. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Perhaps the Lord would help us. Perhaps I'm hearing right. Perhaps I'm not. Hopefully the Lord's in this, right? Uh, let's just 
All different ways we could say this. Perhaps the Lord will help us. What does perhaps the Lord will help us mean? Perhaps he won't. Right? So what do they do? Trust. Because Christians, you know that even if you fail, that all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord. There are things beyond your death that are wonderfully waiting for you. Even if you rush in on the Philistines and they kill you dead right here. So what do they do? They go down and perhaps turn into, yes, and they won. And two guys, one and a half guys, beat 20. And then this, these other three guys, you guys have all heard of these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Oh, yeah. These three little Jewish dudes, right? So they're living in the Babylonian captivity. There's this Babylonian king called Nebuchadnezzar. And he's a mighty king and looked at from his people as a god, probably thought of himself as one, right? And so the story in Daniel chapter 3 talks about how Nebuchadnezzar had this massive golden statue built. Now some theologians think that that golden statue was him, and some people think that it's a false god that he created. But either way, here's what his orders were. Everyone in my kingdom will bow down to that. And if you don't, I'm going to chuck you in the oven. You think you got a tough boss, right? If you don't bow down, I will chuck you in the oven. So this is what the three guys said. And I don't know which one of them said it. But one of them said this. If you throw us in the fire, the God whom we serve is able to save us. That's kind of like a, kind of, he could. But now watch the next sentence. He will rescue us from your power. That's a bit more bold, right? This is the part I want you to hear, though. But even if he doesn't, we will never bow to you or your God. Amen. Right? Amen. Never. Listen, he could save us. He's powerful enough to save us. He will save us. But even if he doesn't, trust. That's trust. Right? And, and listen, they got chucked in the fire, man. They got chucked in the fire. All things work out for the good to those who love the Lord? Really? I got chucked in the fire. I trusted you? I got chucked in the fire. Jesus showed up in the fire. He shows up in... So when it says, He will rescue us from your power, I wonder what they were thinking when they got chucked in the fire. Right? Wait a minute now. I took this bold stand for, for, for the Lord, for this Yahweh dude. And you're thinking, Yahweh? Yeah, way. What's going on here? No way. Yahweh shows up in the fire and delivers them from the power of Nebuchadnezzar. And they walk out of the fire alive and well. They didn't even smell from smoke, it said. That's trust. That's trust. I don't know what's going to happen. They might chuck me in the fire. They might not. He might show up. He might not. We, we're going to go down there and attack those guys. Maybe God will show up and help me. But I trust him because all things work out for the good of those who love the Lord. And he's a reward of those who earnestly seek him. And, he, and nothing you ever do for the Lord is in vain. He knows. He rewards. He counts. He remembers. So my point is that praying for answers is good, but oftentimes we simply have to follow the Spirit's leading in the way we live and the way we advance the kingdom just by doing what we think or feel in that moment that you feel like He wants you to do. You might not get the voice from heaven. I just feel like God wants me to do this. So how about this? Just do it. I almost put up a picture of Nikes. I forgot to do it. Just do it. Right? Why? Because nothing you ever do for the Lord is in vain. He knows it. He, he remembers it. He records it. He'll reward you for it. And ultimately, everything will work out for the good. Even if you try it, and it's an absolute bust, all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord. Pull the stinking trigger, man. 
pull the trigger. And some of us, we just never see kingdom fruit in our life. Never. We want it, right? But we never see kingdom fruit in our life because we don't pull the trigger. In fear of failure or, uh, or, or, or mistake or I, I, I want to be in the center of his will. Pull the trigger, man. Pull the trigger. You know, some of the people that pull the trigger in the kingdom of God, you, know, you get a lot of fighting in the, in the kingdom of God about the right way to do it, the wrong way to do it. And I'm just thinking as I'm preaching right now that I think the Lord just wants us all to shut up about picking on them and just go, hey, man, kudos, you pulled the trigger. I think what you're doing is wrong. You pulled the trigger. Amen. I think what you're doing is wrong. I don't like the way you do ministry, but you're doing something. Awesome, you pulled the trigger. You know, you're doing something. You're here, you're, you're praying, you're serving, you're giving. So- you're doing something. Amen. You pulled the trigger, right? You pulled the trigger. Not, not, listen, none of us are perfect, sinless people, and so sometimes the trigger that we pull is going to be wrong. It's going to be a mistake. It's not what God really wanted us to do. And sometimes the success that we think, like I said earlier, this success that we think we're going to get, because I know God's in this, and I know this is what he wants me to do, and that success eludes us. So we don't pull the trigger because we're afraid of failure. But I think that the Lord wants to help us dramatically up the odds of being in his will more often and pulling the appropriate trigger more often, right? Not perfectly, not all the time, right? But more often, right? And here's, and it's an awesome gift. Here it is, right? Romans 12, 2. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say it, and then I'm going to teach backwards. You ready? Can you get that? No, you can't. You're welcome. There you go. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, and then you will know his will for your life which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Right? See, a lot of us have no spiritual fruit, no kingdom fruit in our life because we haven't pulled the trigger because we don't know what his will is for our life. Listen. To know his good, pleasing, and perfect will, this is what you need to do. Let him change the way you think. Right? So if you want to pull the trigger more often, let him change the way you think. So we're, 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 we're taking a transformed mind and we're going before the Lord and saying, what should I do? And he's like, I already told you what to do. Right? I already told you what to do. You're not listening. You're not listening to me. Right? See, out of a, out of a, a, a mind and heart that is immersed in sin and corruption, what's going to come out of that? Sinful, corrupt Actions, words, plans, processes, life. It's coming out. That's what's coming out, right? If the, if the, if the, if the tree is rotted and no good, the fruit's going to be rotted and no good, right? But, but if, you, if, you, if you become a Christian, right, you get the mind of Christ, and then you get the spirit of Christ, and then he's giving you the word of Christ, and if you'll immerse yourself in this thing every day, all the time, right, just studying it, meditating, it changes the way that you think. And so when you change the way you think, the Bible says... That when you change the way you think, then you'll know his will for your life. So out of a sinful mind and heart comes sinful things. But out of a transformed mind of Christ that's thinking differently, out of that mind and heart comes righteous and holy and pure ministry and ideas, right? And all the while when that's coming out, God is with you. How much more do you need? See, he wants us to pull the trigger, and he's already taught you how to pull the trigger because you're in constant communication with him in prayer and in his word, and he changed the way you think, so what's coming out of you is him, right? He said, if you'll delight yourself in me, I'll give you the desires of your heart. Not I'll give you what you want. I'll give the the wants that you have will be the wants I deposited in you. So when you want to do something, guess who it was? Was it you? No, it was him. 
He's pouring out of you, right? So he wants us to just study and be with him all day. Because if you're a different person, then what you do is what he wanted you to do. He prompted you 2,000 years ago. And you're waiting to be prompted. So you have to understand that you've learned, right? See, if you've immersed yourself in this and, 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 and just studied it and, and written it on your heart so you wouldn't sin against him, and every word is useful to teach us and tells me what's right and what's wrong and corrects me and gets me back on track and it revives the soul and it refreshes the heart and it's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path and it's everything to me. It's a gold mine to me. And that means I've studied and I've immersed myself in it and my words are his words and his words are my words and I've learned and I have changed and this is who I am and so I can trust him, right? That's where we need to live. That's where we need to live. So we need to be led by the Holy Spirit in everything by trusting in God's presence and his transforming power and assured all the while that he will work out everything for your good ultimately. Look, look at Paul, even in verse 23, even though jail and suffering await me in every city. He said the Holy Spirit, this is what the Holy Spirit told me when I was praying. Every city that I'm sending you to is going to be jail and suffering. You can get whipped and beaten and put in jail. Now go. We're not, we're, not, we're not asking for that. We get that. We're like, oh, heck no. I'm not going anywhere, right? I like it right here in my pew. I'm not doing nothing. I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to speak up for the Lord. I don't want to go to church when people tell me I shouldn't. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to offend anybody. How about jail and suffering in every, every service that you go to? Would you do it? I don't know. Okay, that's the first thing. That's being led by the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing. Am I going long? You're supposed to say good. Paul, remember? I'm preaching until midnight, y'all. <laughs> that was a funny laugh. It was like, <laughs> I wouldn't be serious. Here's the second thing. We talked about this, right? First is being led by the Holy Spirit and everything, and then the second thing is complete devotion to advancing Christ's kingdom no matter the cost. We see what Paul said about every city I go to, the Holy Spirit says this. Now, not that you're going to lead a bunch of people. It's going to be revival. No, 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 no. When you go to those cities, suffering in jail. Suffering in jail. But complete devotion to advancing Christ's kingdom no matter the cost. And this keeps coming up in our weekend messages, right? We talked about this the other day. Xavier and I, he's like, why is it every time we come here you beat the crap out of us? We got to do this. We got to do this. We gotta... Because it keeps coming up in the Bible, right? It keeps coming up in the Bible. So what am I going to do? Just to ignore it? It's this pattern over and over and over and over again. And I said earlier, when we got started, why is God repeating things over and over again? Because we need it. Because we... Why do you repeat stuff to your kids all the time? Because they need it. You're going to tell them more than once not to cross the street without looking, right? You're going to tell them over and over again until they finally get it when they're about 16. <laughs> Keeps coming up over and over and over again. Complete devotion, complete devotion, singular purpose. That's why I live. Everything was created by him and for him. Old and New Testament alike. Look at verses like this. Look at Isaiah 50, verse 7. I have set my face like stone, determined to do his will. Like no matter... Hell or high water, no matter what comes my way, I'm doing what God said to do, right? What he said to do, go make disciples of all people. First Chronicles 28.9, King David tells his son Solomon these words of wisdom. Worship and serve God with your whole heart and a willing mind. Isn't that just the same thing as what Paul says? Give your bodies as a living sacrifice. Old and New Testament alike, same exact thing, complete devotion. Give everything that you are to him. And, and Jesus himself, Matthew 6, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness, and then I'll give you everything you need. Don't pursue the things you need. Pursue the kingdom, and I'll give you what you need. Right? The entire ministry of Paul, the entire ministry of Paul displays singular, absolute commitment of all that he is to advance the church of Jesus Christ. Woe to me! If I do not preach, Paul says. And here again in Acts chapter 20, look at verse 18. We're going to read through 24. What's up, Carl? When they arrived, he declared, this is Paul speaking, 
You know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plot of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike. Here it is. The necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. You think that I repeat myself a lot? What did he just say? He repeated what he repeated. He repeats later in one of his letters what he just said there. He repeats what he repeats. He said, I've had one message. Repent and turn to Christ. And what does he say? I think it was it in, in Philippians. I forgot all things when I'm among you, except Christ on the cross and him crucified. That's all he does. Gospel, 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 gospel. What are we going to do this week? Rich, you always ask me, what are you preaching about this week? The gospel. And he comes in the next week. What are you preaching about? I go, Jesus. What are you preaching about this week? Jesus. What are you preaching about this week? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I'm going to preach about Jesus till I'm dead. That's what I'm going to do. That's what a church is supposed to do. It should never get bored, right? He saved you. He, came, he stepped down from his throne in heaven, and he didn't need to, and he was whipped and beaten and went to your cross so he could pay for your sins so you could have eternity forever and ever in his presence. What more could we, what, what else do you want to talk about, the Packers? What else would we, t- sorry. <laughs> he didn't think so, probably. <clears throat> Let's keep reading. I've had one message. Repent of sin and turn to God, having faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me. (laughs) He heard nothing from the Lord except what I'm about to read. I don't know what awaits me. Is it going to be successful if I go here, Lord? Are people going to come to the Lord? Are they, going to, are they going to hear my message? Are they going to know? Are they going to believe? Are they going to repent? Are they going to come? Is it going to be a revival? Is it going to be a Billy Graham crusade? I, 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 what does he say? I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the gospel about the wonderful grace of God. Dude, that's so awesome. Did you notice the word finish? It's a word of completion, right? That means get it done. It doesn't mean just tell Jerome and say, okay, I did what I'm supposed to do. I shared the gospel with somebody today. He's called you to share the gospel with the world, everyone, right? If I tell Jerome, and that's, I'm a slacker, it needs to be more. He said to finish the work, right? Jesus used the same exact word when he said he came to finish the work that his father sent him to do. And that's why Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. A real Christian, a real follower of Christ completes and finishes the work that he's been tasked with. He doesn't play with it. He doesn't manage it. He doesn't doesn't tamper with it. He doesn't doesn't, uh, flirt with it. He doesn't stick his his toe in the the kiddie pool. He, He jumps in and he finishes the work that God has given him. Verse 25, And now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. I declare today that I've been faithful If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. We can read on. He's basically says this. I've never shied away from telling you the truth. You know what you need to know to make a decision for Christ. If you don't get saved, it's not my fault. It's your fault. You didn't listen. You didn't obey. You didn't believe. But I did my part. I told you. I told you. I never shrank back from declaring all that God wants you to know. 
So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, His church. Purchase with His own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you elders. And know, I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out! And then he goes on, he says, I entrust you to the Lord. And then he says, I have to go. And they all weep and cry and hug him and kiss him and send him on his way. But see, the truth is that real life and real purpose and real fulfillment are only found when we live as we've been designed. And Paul understood this, and he embraced this truth. Listen, no matter what else I do, good or bad, if I don't exhaust my every bit of being to advance the gospel, then my life is worthless. You could run. Bill Gates could call you and say, I'm going to make you the, the, not the CEO or the president, the owner of Microsoft. And you could have $10 zillion. But if you don't give your life to spreading the kingdom of God, your life is worthless because you're not living as you've been designed. Paul figured it out. He understood that advancing Christ's kingdom is it, is it. But here's the closing truth, okay? I need you to hear this. We all see that Paul realized that that's what he was to live for. But I'm going to remind you what you heard for weeks and weeks now. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus said. Now go make disciples of all people and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey all that I have taught you. And know this. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So by golly, your assignment is exactly the same as Paul's assignment. And we look up to him as this great spiritual father that had this great work. But couldn't we easily say, Alicia, Your life is worth nothing unless you use it for finishing the work that the Lord Jesus has assigned you of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Rich, your life is worth nothing unless you use it for finishing the work assigned to you by the Lord Jesus the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Xavier, your life is worth nothing to you unless you use it for finishing the work assigned to you by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Karen, your, wor- your life is worth nothing unless you use it for finishing the work assigned to you by the Lord Jesus the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. See, he never told Paul the particulars. He never said, this is exactly what I want you to do. You know what he did? He gave him his spirit as he gave to you, and he said, go. The spirit leads And you follow. And that's it. So let me ask you a question. What's he bringing back up into your mind that you were supposed to do? You don't have to say it out loud, but raise your hand if he's telling you, you feel prompted by him, that he's talking to you about something that you kind of felt that he wanted you to do, but you never did it. Raise your hand if you feel that. You got one, two. Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. So people can see that the Lord speaks. Encouraged, right? Awesome, awesome, awesome. So here's what I want to do. 
My brothers have encouraged me to do this. I didn't think of it, but it takes a family to do this right. So I want to be obedient to what I think the Lord's telling me to do. And I want to do this. In Acts chapter 13, it said the Holy Spirit spoke and he told the leaders of the church, I want you to lay hands on these people and I want you to pray for them because I've given them an assignment and I want you to put your hands on them and bless them as they go so they can be, feel empowered to go do that thing. Okay? I'm nothing special. I'm just like Paul, just humble servant of the Lord, just trying to be obedient to the prompting of his spirit. And so I'm going to pray. And if you feel as though that the Lord has really spoken to you and you just want to be obedient as I'm trying to be obedient right now, as we begin to pray, if you want to come up here, and I'm just going to put my hands on your shoulder and I'm going to pray for you and so that you can sense his empowerment to go do that thing that he's prompting you to go do. Okay? If you don't want to come up, you don't have to come up. It's all good. Can you kill these lights? I don't want anyone to be looking at me, looking at anybody. Just you and the Lord, you and the Lord. We're going to start by praying, and if you feel inclined, you can come up and we can pray for you. I'm not going to be quiet. I'm going to pray out loud so people can hear. You don't have to say what it is, but we're going to just pray. Father, I thank you for your message. I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is true. I thank you, Lord, that it's alive and powerful. I thank you, Lord, that you're still a, a spirit that convicts people of sin, of, 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 of your righteousness, and of the coming judgment. I'm thankful, Lord, that you're still a God that speaks, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you are the Lord and that you do not change. I thank you, Lord, for for speaking to your people this morning. I thank you for the presence of God that is here that's creating a boldness in the people to, to stand up and to be unashamed, but to stand up for you. So Lord, as I begin to pray for these folks, Lord, I just pray that you are really the one blessing them and empowering them. I'm just trying to be obedient to you. I'm just me. I'm not, I'm not you. I'm just trying to be obedient. So, Father, I just pray that whatever it is, that, that uh, is the desire of her heart that you placed inside of her, Lord. I pray that right now, um, as, of, as of this moment, you would now give her the boldness and the courage to do that which you've asked her to do in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask the same thing here. I don't have any idea what's going on inside the heart and mind of this beautiful saint of God, Lord, but you have spoken to her. You've given her some type of idea, some type of, of, of thought, some type of mission, something specific within your kingdom. And Lord, I just pray that you would empower her once and for all to do that thing right now in the name of Jesus. I say the same thing right now, right here. Again, I don't know the dream, but you said if we delight ourselves in the Lord, you'd give us the desires of our heart. And so Lord, I pray that the desire in her heart is your desire, but even if it isn't, Lord, perhaps you will be with her. Perhaps I mean, you will be with her. Perhaps you will go and you will help her in this. Perhaps it's not going to work. But Lord, I pray that you would remind her always that that you are a rewarder of those who earnestly seek you. And so, Lord, I give I pray that you give her the courage right now to step out and do that what she thinks you desire for her life. I ask the same thing for my brother Michael, Lord. I know he is a special man. He is anointed of God. I, Lord, I know that you've given a, 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 an anointing to preach and teach and to bring the word of God to people. Lord, I pray that you give him boldness and courage to step out and do that which he is, has in his heart and his mind. He has a transformed mind. I'm witness to this, Lord. I know you've changed him. I know your word dwells richly inside of him. And I pray, Lord, that his roots will grow down deep into you now. Give him the courage to do that which you've asked him to do. Lord, I ask the same for this young lady, Lord. I don't know what it is inside of her, Lord, that she is that she's burning for right now. There's something inside of her that is burning because you've placed it there. And there's things that have stepped in the way of her doing this. She's been shy. She's been, she's been scared. She's been afraid to do it. Someone may have told her not to do it. But Lord, I pray that your voice would be the voice that thunders in her mind and takes over. And so that she wouldn't hear the other voices. She'd hear your voice saying, step out, my daughter. I love you. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for, the, for these two right now, Lord. There are a new couple here, Lord. I'm thankful that you brought them to our church. Obviously, there's something inside of them that's burning inside of them as well this morning. So, Lord, I pray that you would empower them by your spirit. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. 
what used to be flesh that was frightened and afraid, Lord, I pray that you'd have boldness inside of them. Fill them with your spirit to overflowing, Lord. Let the gospel pour out of the mouths of these two young people. In Jesus' name, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for this beautiful lady of God. She, is, she has the fruit of the Spirit pours out of her all, this, all the time, Lord. Every time that we're with her, the fruit of the Spirit pours out, Lord. But I pray for more. I pray that you'd give her more. You'd fill her even more to overflowing, Lord, so that wherever she goes, people would just see Jesus. They wouldn't see Lady Bonita anymore. They would just see Jesus. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died. Behold the new woman, Lord. I pray that they would just see Jesus. Whatever dreams and visions you've given her of what could be, what she should do for you, Lord. I pray that you would empower her. Not only that, but give her people that would come alongside of her and hold up her arms as she enters the battle for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for this man right here whom I love. I just love that he's a co-laborer with me. I love love him. He's an encourager, Lord. He is a listener. He He has a gentle spirit. Lord, I pray that you would you'd light a fire inside of him. He has, he has love for people, Lord. But I, I, I know that there's things that you've called him to do in his life that have not yet happened. So, Lord, I pray now that you would nourish his roots, that he would be like a tree by the river, drawing up nutrients in every season of his life, that he would bear fruit in every season and his leaves would never, ever wilt Lord, I pray that whatever it is that you're stirring inside of him right now would finally come to pass, that you would honor the prayer that I'm asking right now, but you would honor the prayers of his mom who's been praying for years and years and years for this young man. You have a calling on his life, something special. Whatever it is that's standing in the way of that calling, Lord, I pray that you would bust it down, kill it dead, and send it to hell where it belongs, and release him to do the things you've called him to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I pray for Kaylee. I know that you've called her to do some things too, and I don't know what they are. I really have no idea what they are, Lord. But you've, you've sent her here with her family to this church to use the gifts you've given her to glorify you. There's things inside of her that you've birthed that are there, gifts that you've given, dreams that you've given, desires of her heart that you've put there. So, Lord, I pray now that you would release those things, Lord, and, and so we could start to see them happen here at the church where people can see it. Behold the new woman. Not the woman of old, not the woman of yesterday, but the woman of today. Okay? So, Lord, I pray that you would bless her, strengthen her, give her boldly confidence, not an arrogance in herself or her own abilities or flesh, but a, boldly, a bold Holy Spirit confidence that says, God is with me. God is with me. God is with me. And so therefore I speak. I I believe and therefore I speak. I think that's for you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I love my brother, my soldier in Christ. You said in your word that we need to be soldiers of Christ. And this is a soldier for you, Lord. A strong man of God. A passionate man for you, Lord. And there is definitely, definitely dreams in, in his heart prophetic words that have been spoken over him for years and years and there's been something that keeps him from from moving forward in those things but lord i pray right now that you would release those things so that he would be able to be free to to fly like an eagle lord to be the man of god you've called him to be to lead his family to lead his to lead your church lord to lead in our community lord there are people in this community that will only listen to this man's voice so i pray that you make his voice loud in, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So, Lord, we thank you for this time.